Hey, so I'm curious. Have you ever looked back at a time in your life where, and then realized that your political opinions are cringe as f Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I used to be an anarchist in my early 20s. So, <laughs> so. here's something that I'm kind of curious about. Do you, um, because this is something that I worry about, obviously, a ton, especially doing online politics, especially with all the group-based community sh Do you, um, mm. wh how, how do you know that you're not being cringe as f right now? Like, do you have any safeguards or any techniques? I don't. You, I you don't. Do, do you ever think about it? I, like, what if I, what if in three years, like, everything I think now, I was just missing this key fact or something, like... Of course oh, I I'm think also, about wait, I'm sorry, just to tell you, I'm streaming. I'm oh, sorry, okay, there you go. Oh yeah, no, no. Thank of course I think about this. I think mm -hmm. about this all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unavoidable. Sometimes you, you know, sometimes you, you just change your opinions on something. Mm -hmm. That Like, I dread that people, like, luckily when I was cringy leftist, anarchist, mm -hmm. in my early 20s, I didn't post it on the internet. Mm -hmm. That would be, but in, in the other hand, you know, it's it's a good thing that our opinions evolve. I mean, can you imagine if we would live by a standard where, no, you cannot change your opinions at all, blah, 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 blah. That would be terrifying, in my opinion. At least. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree with that, but I feel like when I, when I speak about certain political topics, I like to feel like I have some level, some reasonable level of certainty that I'm not like completely deluding myself. I guess that's like an important, for me at least personally, that's an important thing for mm -hmm. me. But it seems so hard because... I guess like something I think about like this is less political and more life related but like I've learned a lot of things in life that if I had a time machine and I could go back and tell myself when I was like 15 16 like hey try harder in high school um, I know for a fact that even if I knew I was coming from the future my 16 year old self wouldn't listen to me <laughs> like he would just be like nah you probably sold out you're a dumb f I'll figure it out like I guess I, yeah. I like to feel like I have like some level of certainty so I'm, I'm just curious if there are any like mental techniques or safeguards or anything well, the, the, the one safeguard that I use for myself, mm -hmm. um, like one of the most important political books that I've ever read, and it's pretty much the only philosophy book that I've ever read in my life, mm -hmm. is Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies. And the really big lesson that it teaches in it is that there is no such thing as someone who is politically always right. Mm -hmm. So the, the best safeguard you can have politically speaking, is to constantly question yourself. Mm -hmm. And I do that frequently. Like, um, the videos that I make, not anymore, but when I used to make political videos, mm -hmm. um, three out of four of my videos never went public. Mm -hmm. Because I kept watching them again and again, thinking of, okay, how could this be taken apart? And I tried taking my own videos apart by myself. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be critical of yourself. I think it's a virtue to have, a good virtue, to be critical of yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's very lacking on the internet because a lot of internet personality stuff is built on um, never being wrong you know. yeah yeah. Hmm. yeah so but yeah um <laughs> we we just have to live with that gotcha. why is there a reason why that came up um no i mean it's just it's something that i think about myself a lot and then when i see other people that mm -hmm. um especially that are digging into things like i feel like i feel like my view on some things has so radically evolved that when I look back, I worry why I ever had the other view. Because I feel like I could have justified both at both points in times. But like with a little bit further context, um, it feels like I was just so wrong on the other one. So for example, I'm sorry, we just, we, sometimes we watch some of your videos on stream um, and you echo a lot of thoughts that I've had. So we just watched the one that you had related to pacifism. Um, I used to be fervently, four years ago, I was fervently anti-US intervention on everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then like, it takes you like two days of reading to see how absolutely fucking stupid it would be for the US to just completely step back on the world stage and just cede all of that ground to everybody. But that's like something that I would have defended like really hardcore for a lot of what felt like decent reasons. So yeah, I don't know. I guess mm. I just get worried that like, it's, it's, it, you know, that, that in particular is just something that has um, gone into the background. Have you ever heard the term social imperialism? Um, not directly, maybe. It's it, yeah. It, I would not be surprised if you have never. I've heard. heard the, I've heard of the of term dead. cultural imperialism, but what is social imperialism? It's it's a kind of a dead term, to be honest. Um, back in the sixties and fifties, when the Soviet Union rolled into Hungary and Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia and into Poland and crushed protests there, mm -hmm. people in the West who were Marxist, mm -hmm. apol um, the apologetics for it was that they called it a social imperialism. 
that it was a kind imperialism, mm -hmm. an imperialism that saved socialism, so to say, and therefore it was an acceptable socialism. And um, what was the point I was going to get with? Yeah, there's two points you can make with that. It's um, when in the context of pacifism on that political side of that video that you just watched, mm -hmm. we often in our day and age in the post-Cold War era, we forget how aggressively the Soviet Union pursued outside power and we often focus too much on ourselves yeah. and don't look at outside interferences. Nobody knows that Vietnam, uh, the same year the Americans pulled out of Vietnam, China invaded that country mm -hmm. because it refused to be a Chinese puppet. Like th these struggles go on all the time. Yeah. yeah, this is something that I kind of wonder about um, in terms of like, and, and I feel like I got caught up a little bit even too, um, maybe not quite as much as other left-leaning progressive people even, but like it feels like we went so hard on demonizing U.S. foreign intervention, a lot of which can be like pretty fucked up, um, into like... Oh, there, the, there was a lot to demonize. Let me yeah, be very sure. frank about one thing. Um, well... But the I, fantasy that it's frank. only the United States that does it is so far removed from reality, and it bothers I, me that I, I never even considered that for so long. The way, the way I see it, and the thing that I blame the most for it was is the Bush administration, and it's just moronic invasion of Iraq, mm -hmm. completely moronic invasion. Of Here, Iraq. oh, you brought up a term. You brought it, You posed a hypothetical. I don't know if you've explored this in any video about how um, had the invasion gone differently, would we think differently about it? I, so mm -hmm. I, we probably don't disagree at all. The the post invasion dismantling of the government and everything that followed was a nightmare yes. on an unimaginable level. I wonder if that it. yeah, I wonder if that would have been put together in a better way if we would actually have an overall positive view of yeah. of, of that. I'm yeah, so it's, curious it's about that. Question. There's so many hypotheticals that you can put up there, like. What if the Bush administration had not lied about its intentions? Mm -hmm. What if they had just straight up said, we want to remove this dictator? Sure. Would well, I think even if we did, given the outcome now and how horrible the administration was in handling the, the transfer of power, I think we still would have had a bad view on it just because the, I feel like people are very, do you ever play poker? Uh, no. Uh, what, what, to yeah, what, check a lot. one thing that, I, one thing that I learned a lot for, for related to poker is that, um, you can never be outcome oriented. Um, because an outcome could come from like, like for instance, if you do an action and there's like a 3% chance of success and you succeed, it doesn't mean the action was good, but people see things that way. Like if you, if you bet like a million dollars on getting heads five times in a row and you get heads five times in a row, people will be like, oh, that was a really good bet. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a really bad bet. You just got lucky. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder that about yeah, like that, a lot of foreign policy that, ends as well. That's, that's interesting that you put it, it. Have you ever heard of black swan t theory? No, I haven't. Oh, Eric, um, Black Swan events. Go, Eric, go ahead. Tell, tell me about it. it. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's um, the book is for Nicholas Nassim Tayyip, who, who oh, he, the he builds this guy? great theory. And he makes it, yeah, he uh, makes yeah. this really great point that when we talk about past historical events mm -hmm. to form our modern and inform our modern political things, what we often ignore is that the events that occur that we talk about we often just do rationalizations for events that were utterly and completely in, unpredictable, mm -hmm. that were black swan events that completely under, just throw our understanding of the world on its head. Yeah. Nobody predicted 9-11. Nobody saw that one coming miles away. Well, complete, you know. yeah, maybe. I mean, they did do it once before, right? <laughs> but but I, I know what you mean. Maybe yeah, for yeah, that but particular what, what thing. I'm trying to point out is mm -hmm. when people come in and say, when, when the Chomskyites of the world come in and say that, oh, yes, this is the the result of like American exactly. imperialism, blah, blah, blah. These are all just after the fact rationalizations. Oh, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, so I like to think of these things in, in a kind of scientific sense. So if I, if I ever try to say something like that, my goal would be describing the past as whatever. Your goal is to create a model that can fit the future, though, right? You want to be able to make predictions. Um, explaining the past is very boring if you can't develop a model that will give you predictions after it. Mm -hmm. And it does feel like a lot. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, <laughs> obviously this one thing was going to happen after this thing. It's like, really? Are you sure that like a million other things? Things could I was, have happened. I was, I was, when you called me, I was listening to the audiobook from Zehi Blochi, mm -hmm. who is a historian on, on Ukraine, about, I was listening to his book on, Ukra uh, on Chernobyl. Okay. And he builds this incredibly great narrative backed up with the research that he did that shows, for example, when the, when the Holodomor happened in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it completely disrupted the agricultural sector of Ukraine. It never really recovered. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the collectivized farms never really worked. And a result of that was that starting in the 1940s, right through up to the 1970s, on a regular basis, Ukrainian government officials that ran the large agricultural farms your fucking mouth. had to draft people out of other industry sectors, from power stations, from factories, out of their jobs into the fields to pick potatoes and help that agricultural sector somehow maintain itself and somehow produce the, by the standards that it was required to. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was that the other industry sectors were largely lacking behind. Everything was done on rush. And one of the things that was done on rush was the reactor in Chernobyl, the testings, etc., etc. And he builds this great narrative where he explains that economic deficiencies that resulted out of the Holodomor in logistics, etc., etc., in the end resulted to a chain of complex events mm -hmm. that led to the disaster in 1986. Hmm. But this is also just as much of a pa past tense rationalization. Yeah. It is a very scientific one because Chomsky, if we are being honest, is not very scientific. He sometimes yeah. just makes shit up. Yeah, a lot but, of social you know, science... Ooh, fuck, I don't like to say this, but sometimes it can feel a little Freudian where we're just kind of constructing things after the fact and we hope that they fit. Um, I, what, something that I got an email from a, from a history PhD that um, drilled into my head two things super hard. One is the different... I'd never heard this term before until I was 30 years old. Um, one is that there's a difference between history and I believe the term is historiography. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've never heard that term before, um, ever, and I completely never even considered it. Um, there was that, and then there was um, the idea that there is no such thing as a historical counterfactual. Anytime somebody says, this would have happened, th that is just totally fucking, you have no idea. You can make guesses, but there's no true historical counterfactual. You can never say what something would have actually been. And when you try to go past, like, one or two things, like, oh, well, if we wouldn't have done this, then maybe we could have done that, and then this would have happened. Once you go past, like, one major event, the entire history of the world would, could be so radically different yeah. that to try to make I, predictions I, past I that is absurd. Mm -hmm. Every time I read through the history of the Middle East, I always kind of have to ask myself, if, if the Iraq war wouldn't have happened, would the Arab Spring have happened in Iraq and would it have removed Saddam Hussein? Or is the Arab Spring a result of the invasion of Iraq? Mm -hmm. like you, 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 when you think about these things, you just go, you, you lose your mind after a while because there are so many interconnected little things mm -hmm. that add up to a wider picture. At least when you go and examine it from a perspective of where you just try to find the facts, you know, the numbers, agricultural output, victim numbers pollution, etc., etc., and add them all up together, geography, God knows what. Mm -hmm. There's so many factors that interplay in all of this. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, fuck. I just wanted yeah. to bug you on the, on the making sure, you're, yeah, fact-checking. Oh, no problem. Okay. If you ever, if you ever have a, let me just look up the, 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 there are some notes on this. You know, I, I made some mistakes in these earlier videos. In the China video, the, um, the Austronesians didn't originate from Madagascar, but from Taiwan. That's <laughs> a mistake no. that I made. Well, I, yeah, um, I, I saw that. That was really cringe. Everybody yeah. knows that, but I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, wait, wait, when you make a mistake uh, like that, how do you normally correct it? Do you just post like a YouTube comment or? I can't. What I thought about doing is make a video at the end of the year where I just list all the mistakes I made. Mm -hmm. um, oh, gotcha. Do you, you can't you... retroactively... Have you ever heard of the show Mythbusters? Yes, I have. I think I think I've they. I watched it when I was younger. Yeah, I think they do something different. I, I think there are a few shows that do something where they go back um, retrospectively and they'll make like an episode where they go back and they retest a bunch of things that they might have gotten wrong or missed or whatever. It, it just kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm watching the video and it just reminds me of one really big point. Like one of the reasons why I wanted to make this video mm -hmm. is that I I was really annoyed by how people when they criticized the intervention in Iraq, which we all know and we already said was a bad intervention, how they paint this really nice picture of Saddam Hussein. Saddam was a fucking monster. Yeah. There's no other way around saying it. He mm -hmm. was a monster um, responsible for what might be the largest genocide in Middle Eastern history. So yeah, that's something that really annoyed me. And how two, how two sided this is, like a lot of people don't know about Jeremy Corbyn that he opposed the intervention Bosnian. in Bosnia. Yeah, I didn't know that yeah. either, actually. I had no idea. I don't he know much about Corbyn. And he still thinks he still thinks it was a bad idea, but it was a, the right thing to do. But we don't see people like Blair and Clinton and Bush Sr. being praised for that intervention. 
mm-hmm. for going to war, a right war, a war that had to be fought. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. When I started to try to find more positive examples of intervention, Bosnia seemed to be one of the few cases where the U.S. like took a leadership role, and it was incredibly positive. Or it well, seemed to it, be when it, the rest of the world like couldn't. The Vietnamese, the Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia, mm-hmm. when the Americans pulled out of Vietnam, the reason why China invaded Vietnam is because Vietnam invaded Cambodia to put an end to the Pol Pot regime, and that was a. The Vietnamese officially say that it was a humanitarian intervention to stop the genocide that had already killed a third of the Cambodian population. Mm-hmm. Um, it might also have been about more geopolitical interv- uh, influence, but it was an intervention by a communist regime, but still one has to say a good intervention because it stopped the Cambodian genocide. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, well, I got to sleep soon because I'm fucking tired. I got a lot of shit going on, but I really appreciate the conversation, bud. No problem. If you have more questions, then let me know. Yeah, sure. Thing. Um, okay. Do you really know about that mistake you made in the China video? What? No, I was joking. Did I not sound like I was joking? Obviously, I don't know fuck all about where people, different groups, I think I couldn't tell you five ethnic groups in China. Um, but, okay. It's called the US flag, you stupid fuck. This is the only flag that the United States federally has and recognizes. Why the fuck are you acting like the a different 